Calgary and have been doing uh, stuff with uh, virtual scenarios for a long time now. And uh, a lot of the stuff we'll be talking about today relates to a program called Open Labyrinth or OLAB. And uh, uh, one of the declarations I need to make is that I am the uh, development lead for the Open Labyrinth Consortium, uh, but I don't make any money out of it, sadly. So it's not much of a declaration, I'm afraid. Um, no other conflicts of interest. Uh, copyright for the, the slides, you're welcome to take uh, uh, pictures and uh, copies of anything you see and it has been recorded. You can access that afterwards. Uh, all the slides are Creative Commons. And as Kathy mentioned, it is being recorded, the session. So I am going to share my screen now and let's get off and running. Okay, so there's my PowerPoint. Can we pause just for one second, David? We just wanted to let you know uh, questions. Krista will be um, taking note of questions for David in the chat and we'll sort of um, collect them as we go. Uh, really simple or, um, you know, uh, general types of questions that I can answer. I may just go ahead and answer in the chat, uh, but otherwise we are collecting them for, you know, sort of pauses and at the end of these mini didactic sessions. Um, so, uh, so feel free to ask in the chat, or if you also want to, if you're not, you know, comfortable using the chat, feel free to just put your hand up or, uh, you know, jump in if, uh, if that doesn't seem clear. Uh, for those who are less familiar with the Zoom, uh, the little reactions button is where the hand, um, the hand is. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for uh, clarifying Thank that. So today we're talking about, um, Perfect, get a hair in my mouth right off the bat. Very professional, David. Uh, learning from error, learning from your mistakes and um, how you can uh, design case studies, uh, branching scenarios and open labyrinths, et cetera, so that um, uh, make best use of it. But the learning from your mistakes, both, of them, both as an author and as a learner, is gonna be a central theme here. Why are my slides changing? There we go. Um, so a lot of the stuff will be around Open Labyrinth and you can see the website there. It was originally a virtual patient program, but we have moved much beyond that. And a lot of what we're talking about today is not just about patients. You can use this in all sorts of uh, learning scenarios. Um, and uh, what do we mean by virtual scenarios? These are basically screen-based stories, little uh, click through a series of pages, making some, some decisions, etc. We're not talking about virtual reality, VR and all that kind of thing. And uh, these, in some designs, these can be more like a choose your adventure, choose your own adventure story. If you remember those little books, you know, the thing where, uh, you know, you had to make the choice between, uh, you know, do you, do you uh, kill the princess or rescue the dragon or do you want to be boringly conventional and do it the other way around, etc. Um, and depending on how you choose the story unravels. OLAB itself is a very powerful program, and so you're not required to do that sort of thing. You can do, do anything you want in it. But one of the things we want to talk about today, and one of the more powerful uh, learning designs that we've, we found, is the use of uh, branching rather than linear cases. And by linear cases, I mean, you, you want to get past the idea of it just being a page turner and a story, that, that you have decisions and that when somebody makes a decision, they have to deal with the consequences of that decision. Part of the reason that we stress that is that, um, yes, you can build quizzes in OLAB, um, but there's, there's tons and tons of uh, quiz software out there. OLAB will do that, but um, it will do much more. And it's one of the few programs which easily allows you to sort of build branches and pathways. And the, the analogy I would, I would give as a teacher is that on the, in the exam or most online, online learning, if you're given a choice, if you don't make the right choice, a little man will pop up with a wee red flag and go, no, that's not correct. Or there'll be something which indicates that right away. But in real life, that's not what happens. You make a decision, you work with what happens from that decision. And sometimes it turns out to be great and sometimes it turns out not to be good and you still have to deal with that. And we found that premise to be very powerful with, with our learners at multiple levels. One of the things I do want to kick across to you in terms of thinking about your case designs is that great stories really work well, um, 
but it's awfully easy to uh, get drawn into making things pretty, to build in fancy gizmos and singing, dancing avatars and all that. And while you'll score brownie points with your learners to start with, because things look cute, that um, uh, s simplicity can be your friend. And uh, we often tell the story of, uh, I don't know if you, if you guys are familiar with the story of the, uh, of the uh, Fisher space pen, which I think cost uh, NASA something like $2 million to develop this fancy pen that could be used in zero G and all sorts of adverse conditions. And the Russians had a much simpler solution. They just used a pencil. So it's uh, simplicity can be great. And this really drove home to me. So this is a virtual patient case. And this is the very first one that was, was thrown at me. Um, it was incredibly simple and yet incredibly powerful. Uh, so this is Sarah Jane. And Sarah Jane is an 18 month uh, uh, infant and you have to figure out what's going on. And uh, set in the UK where they still do house calls. The whole interface is exactly like you see. It was very plain. There's not a single picture in the whole thing. It's a story based on text, etc., And you have to pick up and imagine uh, the story just from the text details. And you work your way through with choices. But it was incredibly challenging. And, and I'm still somewhat embarrassed to admit that the first uh, five times that I tried the Sarah Jane case, I managed to kill the poor little darling. And we'll come to that shortly and how that affects learners. It was an incredibly difficult case because it was well designed, but it got to the end, you go, ah, I'm gonna do that again. I'm sure there's a better way of doing this. And eventually you figure out that you had to get a move on and not waste too much time in terms of resuscitating this poor little, little infant, et cetera. So quite striking and quite powerful. And as an example of how powerful uh, this can be, this, this is a, a London student who has just killed Sarah Jane and she's like obviously mortified. This is an imaginary patient. But it shows, I mean, I'm not trying to be intentionally cruel to our students, but emotions in learning are powerful. And she was very gracious to allow us to use this picture, et cetera. But it was, it was striking how the students would really get engaged with this of plain text. It's the problem solving that matters. Um, and there are very few tools out that allow that. Also, the way that OLAV is set up, that you can, you can look at how they work through the decisions. You can't take the lids off their heads and see what the brains are doing, but you can see how, what decisions they make and how they make them, etc. This idea of consequences learning from mistakes is uh, crucial. Um, if any of you are interested in learning more about scenario-based learning as a principle, there's an excellent book by uh, Ruth Colvin Clark about that. And she stresses, yeah, we all talk about learning from our mistakes. Why don't we use that principle more? All right, so that's the initial uh, sort of pitch that I want uh, sort of get the idea across to you. Um, happy to throw it open to some immediate questions in terms of what the hell are you talking about here, Tops? But um, the, in this first breakout, because uh, uh, we do believe in making our workshops that people are working, that you're not here just to hear uh, us tell stories, et cetera. Um, we want you to uh, you know, just get in and brainstorm. Okay, so there's the premise. How might you use that kind of thing? And a little bit of brainstorming in the group as to how this might be useful to you just as a problem solving or problem assessment method in your teaching. Um, I say it doesn't have to be clinical at all. Um, Krista has a great uh, example of dealing with a bridge collapse as an example. Um, the, the team has some of their own little uh, uh, cases they can show you their own if, if that's to your choice. And uh, just to give you a uh, an idea as to when we come back from the breakout, um, we will be reporting back into what we discussed, but this will not be something formal. Um, I, I don't find it helpful to have go around each room, well, what did you discuss in a summary of each uh, panic? Because uh, what always happens is the first room takes far too long, and then the other two rooms do the, um, what she said. Um, so it'll be snapshots. What was interesting? One, one sentence, one, uh, one piece that was interesting in the community discussion. It doesn't have to be the most important piece. It's just something that was uh, striking for you guys. Uh, that tends to lead to a much more interesting pullback discussion. And it takes pressure off that nobody's assigned to be formally the um, uh, re uh, recorder, etc. All right. Uh, any questions before we jump to our breakout rooms? 
All right, let's go to our breakout rooms. Uh, so there'll be four of us and uh, we'll try and assign you randomly and hopefully it works for the next time around that uh, we keep you in the same groups, but... <sighs> it should be good, it should be good. So um, the only thing is I don't appear to be able to assign myself. So I think once you've all well, gone, I'll be able to join breakout room I one. Drop my sharing. Um, opening the rooms now, uh, it's, I made 25 minutes, uh, just an FYI, um, right. to allow for a bit of, um, a bit of, uh, you know, introductions, discussions, So we'll come back at 8.05? Yeah, yeah, and you'll have a two-minute warning, not All a one-minute right. warning. Okay. Two-minute warning after 25 minutes. We'll see a bunch of you guys in room four. See you in the flip side. <laughs> so welcome back everyone um so i hope we how was the time i hope we didn't get too badly cut off you just give me like a thumbs up thumbs down it was good i i, I cut my group off because i misinterpreted the two minute warning as being okay time to go back and i'm sitting there ah, okay yeah, so you'll always get a two minute warning. So you have time to wrap up your discussion. And then after the two minutes, it will automatically bring you back. So um, I was good with time until the two minute timer came up. And then I lost track of time. So I got cut <laughs> off right in the middle. Mid sentence. Same here. Same here. That's, <laughs> that's a sign of a good, uh, you know, good stuff going on. I'm always happy when the students come back and say, ah. Anyway, um, so do you want to? do the shout out uh yeah let's, so let's do that so let's um um so we'll go around the rooms one two three four and say I, it's not a summary of everything you discussed just any anyone from room one who wants to volunteer a particularly interesting point that was raised in your discussions we had a question i don't remember whose question it about uh students being able to see uh, was it Arlene? Do you want to speak or do, should I speak for you? I don't see Arlene. So I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I am here. here. Okay, um, my question was wondering if, I don't think I particularly said C, but if the students would get feedback or hints that would direct them somewhere. I think it was related to another question that asked specifically about the um, the, all the stuff on the side with the the little yes that one too yes and the I don't know if that's uh, the 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 notes uh, like the kind of uh, oh, notes yeah. section and if they can keep that afterwards if they can see it afterwards and if they see because I know what I see as a teacher but I haven't really you know explored what can the students see um, after they finish the, finish the case in terms of do they get a summary of the answers they put in or their path etc. So for any of you who've played with the Open Labyrinth interface, the, the, the standard view that you see has this funny little notepad on the side, which is, so yes, students can record their own notes in there, but it's for their own use. Um, and we, we start, well, actually the, the developers, um, without asking, added this, wouldn't this be a good idea? Um, it, it's turned out to be not so useful because it's um, it, it's not attached to the program at all. It's not easy to share. And why would you just fire up a, some sort of a notepad of, of your own, etc. Building the program is a bit odd. So it's it's a bit of an orphan thing that we don't use much. Uh, for the bigger question of how do you provide feedback as you go, um, lots of different ways. So you can just. I, as, you, you know, as they click on a choice and uh, they, they, they uh, go to the next screen, you can tell them directly, uh, you know, give them some feedback. So um, one of the, as a quick example of that, one of the, the fallacies that tends to be perpetrated on medical, uh, medical students is they order a test and instantly they get the result. Well, that's not real life at all. It's like four hours to 24 hours later you get the result. So in the meantime, still, what are you gonna do with the patient? And so we build in things like your test has been ordered. The lab tech has gone for coffee. She will call you back at 3 p.m. Now, what do you want to do? Things like that. So you can give immediate and real life feedback and you know, their actions. Um, you can, sometimes it is appropriate to give them, uh, this is what happened that you mess with what's called virtual time, etc. cetera. Um, we have mechanisms in there so that the end of the case you can give them a little case summary with various scores and uh, this is how you answer this is the ideal answer for this question so it, that's called a session report um, so there's lots of different ways and then there are some analytics built into the program so you can start to do 
uh, show to the group. This is what the group decided. This is where uh, this is where the average score was, etc. So, so, so it's it's there's lots of different ways of providing that feedback. When you're first starting out, keep it nice and simple because you can always take a case that you've started already and start to build in these these other complexities. Okay, group two. So we um, <laughs> so we ended our session uh, on a question about how can we get our students to um, take a look at these branching scenarios that we're making. So currently, um, we're making accounts on the demo server for people who are interested, and we'll provide those after the after the workshop. And so you have the ability to make a, a branching scenario open access, and once it's open access, pretty much. Anybody who doesn't have an account can actually um, uh, can complete or access the branching scenario. Um, in order to get information about who is completing the branching scenario, we can actually enter or ask students to enter questions so that when you go and review each of these sessions where the case, uh, where the branching scenario was actually accessed, you'll know based on, on, um, on, or bait. So you'll know who it is that completed the branching scenario based on the information that they've entered in text fields that you yourself have entered into your, uh, your branching scenario. Uh, there was some discussion as to uh, the implementation of open labyrinth on Dawson servers. I don't have a lot of information on that. I think, um, yeah. Did, uh, I, 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 yeah. I will touch on that very briefly. Um, I think that rather than bog down the whole group on the joys of setting up your own web server and stuff like that, that people who are interested in asking about that, that contact uh, me directly afterwards, because there's lots of different ways. But as uh, Jason pointed out, we're happy to give people a demo, uh, accounts on our demo server where you can get in. You, can, you don't have to set things up. You can just get in there and play and try stuff out yourself. Okay. So just as an addendum to that, we actually do have it set up on the Dawson server. We're just still having issues with kind of the back end setup and uh, some, some um, uh, the image uploader not working, some, some sort of key features that are not fully functional yet. So, you know, uh, and IT has been very, very, very busy because of the online uh, environment and they've been very, you know, very helpful setting us up, but uh, some of the, you know, some of the, the maintenance glitchy, you know, initial setups phase is still, uh, is still not, you know, fully working. So um, uh, right now, David, Sorry? So you guys as teachers should not have to deal with that. That's right. Yeah. So, um, but David has, has offered for that. We're currently using the demo server. Uh, Chris and I are using both, but, um, but David has offered to uh, provide demo yeah. server accounts for those who want. And I will provide a, I'll, I'll have a sign up sheet at the end. Group Go ahead, three. Jan. Uh, sorry, I don't want to take too much time or anything, but I, and I don't want to ask too much uh, techie questions, but the, uh, so if I'm understanding this correctly, is this embedded, can this be embedded into Moodle or not yet or not at all? Yeah, so it can be embedded into Moodle. So um, you, can, you can embed cases within Moodle or ironically, you can embed Moodle within all that, et cetera. So it, it does play with other software quite well. And there's, there's, there's simple ways you can do that and there's sophisticated uh, handshaking ways you can do that, but yes. Okay, because I saw that you could use H5P inside uh, yep. OLAB so I was thinking you could use H5P inside of OLAB and OLAB inside Moodle. Am I yep. correct? Yeah. And then I, you can take those H5P, uh, sorry, H5P, the funny little interactive widgets that some would be familiar with, but you can take a widget which is designed in Moodle, play it in OLAB, or one which is designed in OLAB and play it in Moodle. They're very portable. I, I perfect, perfect. Great. That's why I thought I just uh, wasn't too sure after those few comments. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. We're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, group three, any quick points that you, that uh, highlights you wanted to discuss? So for our group, um, the big thing was feedback. So, and also are the students able to, if they make a decision, let's say for, for us, it was uh, depending on the category of the patient and then they get more information, are they able to go back? How freely is that, is it doable for them to go back to past decisions change their answers and then continue through 
um, the scenario. So that was one thing that they found um, possibly interesting. All right. So it, it, when you're doing cases as, you know, like for either um, formative assessment or just teaching and exploration, et cetera, the old browser back button is, can be your friend. You can undo any of your decisions. Um, I will warn you that if you have counters built into your case, it doesn't undo the counter score. So that gets confusing and that can sometimes uh, have an uh, unintended consequence in your case, but you, you can sort of roll things back. There's also within the standard simple OLAB interface, there's something called review your pathway where you can look at any, you can go back and click on, uh, it's kind of like a, like a mini history. Uh, the, the, you can look oh, three steps back, what did that say again? And you can do review your pathway, look back the, the three steps back, click on that and it'll go direct there and you can continue from there. Uh, in simple cases, that's easy to do. In complex cases with counters, um, it sometimes uh, messes things up a little bit. In an exam situation, sometimes you don't want that. You don't want them to be able to undo things. And because it's through a web browser, it's actually quite hard to, to completely prevent that. And so in situations where we don't want them to roll back and undo things, what we tell our students is A, the way the case is set up, that if you do that, it may bollocks up the rest of your session and invalidate your score. B, we will know that you've done it because every single click, including the back button is recorded. And so if you say, I didn't do that, we'll go, yeah, you did. You did it at 8.32 a.m. on the 2nd of June and, and, and uh, it had to be you because you were logged in. So uh, in an exam situation where you want to enforce that, uh, it's, it's, it's very, um, very much checked. And so, so this, it becomes like an anti-cheating device in a situation where you want to force forward movement. Okay. Um, uh, Inet has her hand up. Can we take one last and then go into sure. the... Uh into the yeah, next session. Quick here. Um, yeah. Hi, it's um, it's a little related. So, and also I don't want to take up too much time, but is it, there a possibility for students uh, to redo a case, let's say later on uh, in the course and compare their paths? Yes. Easily see their pathways through? Yeah. And as an author, you can, you can set a course up so that you can either allow multiple plays or you could lock them into a, a single play. And when you're looking at like group scores, you can, so one of the situations we have is sometimes we want the first time they played it. And sometimes you want the latest time they played it. So you, you can pick, pick, pick those, but you have control over what they can do with that. All righty, we should probably move on here. Great questions, everyone. Thank you. Alrighty, uh, make sure I'm on the right slide here. Yes, I am. So I can share my screen. Desktop one. Okay, so just done our shout out and there were some super questions there. Everybody see the screen okay? All right, uh, my slide moving isn't, there we go. So uh, this next bit, I wanna talk about um, a bit more about uh, some case design issues, uh, Lego blocks, situational judgment testing and team-based learning. Um, and since we're a little bit behind, I shall try and be speedy on this. So, David, we're 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 okay. Like, all right, we're, okay. we're back on track. You've got oh, ten minutes until the next breakout, but yeah, we're all right. We're good. That I won't rush it. So, um, one of the things that I do want to put across is that um, uh, OLAB has been intentionally set up so that you can share cases that it. One of the things that many, many years ago when uh, virtual scenario software first came along was there was a fairly rapid turnover of vendors and authoring groups got tired of the fact that, yeah, they put all this time and effort and money into designing cases and then the software would go belly up and they'd lose all that material. Um, so the, the, we were very actively involved in the movement around uh, sharing of cases. And there's actually a, a, a data standard. So you can take a complete case, you can package it up into a, like a zip file and you can port it, uh, port it into another server. Uh, and you can also take um, standardized cases from other software and import it into all that. So it just helps in terms of sustainability, longevity of projects. But on a more so for um, curriculum and deans and stuff like that, that's a crucial thing because they don't want to lose all your good work. But for you as case authors, case authors, 
Um, there's also the important thing that you can uh, take an existing case and you can tweak it. Go, I kind of like that case, but it doesn't quite fit what we want. So you take it and modify it. Um, and the, the, that ability to uh, modify existing materials uh, has turned out to be really quite useful, especially since you don't have to uh, share the entire case. So the analogy would be, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but quite commonly uh, as a speaker at um, conferences and sessions, people will ask afterwards, can I have a copy of your slides? Oh, sure, not a problem. But in reality, they don't want a copy of your whole presentation. There's two or three graphics or something about that they want out of the, the, the nobody ever reuses um, a, a slide presentation unchanged. And it's the same with cases. People always want to tweak them. It's relatively easy in, in all that for a number of reasons. And you can also take pieces of cases. So you can take, you can steal pictures from one to another. You can uh, take a certain question set, et cetera. You can copy and paste them between, um, between cases. And the, this uh, little subheading of why do open object repositories, why do they fail? Um, because there's lots of them out there and they're mostly empty. And it's this false premise that people want you know, that you have created the ideal lecture or the ideal case to teach such and such and everybody else will use it unchanged. Well, no, everybody wants to put their own spin on things. And we promote that idea in OLAV that you can take bits and pieces of, uh, and it's not just a case of sharing the whole slide deck. Um, not, not a very good segue here, but this is, uh, there's, there's lots of different ways of using um, uh, OLAB and one of the more interesting areas both on the clinical side of things but also now for many other disciplines is um, a it's a testing methodology but it's also a good way of presenting problems and it's called situational judgment testing so there is a book by uh, Metcalf it's it's fairly cheap it has lots of nice little examples those are medical questions but it gives you a sense of how to design these things. And there's lots of examples out there. And the, we touched on this in uh, group four, but I'll throw it out for the rest of the group. A situation of judgment testing, for those who are unfamiliar, it's, um, you, you basically have a question stem or a mini scenario, which is, um, uh, so I'll, I'll, you, I'll, I'll repeat the example that's often used. Uh, you're a student, you come into a lecture and that you're late, but the room is packed. What do you do? And so you give them choices like you, you sneak down the front, uh, making noise, but there's better space down the front. You're not going to crowd anybody out of that. Or do you clamber across three people because there's a seat in the middle of a, a, a row in the, in the halfway across? Or do you stand and squeeze in beside the fire door perilously close to the light switch? So you give them choices. And this is the sort of thing where, um, they can relate to it in real life, they're practical, and it's not single best answer. It's not that there is a correct choice. It's, it's a whole ton of things. And it's how do you rate the, not, not pick one, but rate the available choices from better to worse. Uh, it's been shown to be quite useful in getting people to think about problems uh, and judging situations. I say it's, um, it's, it's been around for 40 years. It's not specific at all to medicine. Um, but uh, and is now used in lots and lots of different formats, etc. Um, so that's uh, as, as a, uh, a mini piece to build within your cases. That's uh, worth exploring. Um, and uh, so I had a, a fun, fun example here for uh, and, uh, instead of crowding to the lecture theater, which I'll, I'll let you guys uh, read at your own pace. But it's basically the you know you give them some choices and you and they rank them from good you know good to bad and one of the interesting things that we found in terms of picking up um distressed learners or learners who have some challenges is that um normally the 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 the, the, the choices you're given kind of oscillate around it there's a couple of good ones there's a mediocre one and a couple of bad ones but what about if you have all of the all of the choices be bad choices so you look at the first choice and go oh, i don't think i'd do that you look at the second choice and go oh no that's worse you get at the third choice and no nah, definitely not to do that and you get to the last choice and go oh my 
my God, who the hell would actually choose that? That's insane. And it's useful because we uh, our, our evidence is that these ne- what we call negatively skewed responses are good at picking up um, uh, thinking and decision making, which is uh, is an outlier. So it's not it's not for marking who are the best. It's looking for your marginal cases and people who are struggling in a certain area. So it's an interesting technique. Uh, no cats or dogs were harmed in the making of this SJT. Alrighty, um, last little thing I'll quickly touch on is uh, OLAB has a, a, a number of things uh, built into it which allow you to make more sophisticated, more sophisticated, <laughs> more sophisticated cases um, and which help with team-based learning. So you can put little counters and scores and stuff so you can reward them with extra points for being good kids. Uh, one of the things we commonly do because medical students, they, they order way too many lab tests is we'll do a running counter of, uh, very good, nice that you've uh, ordered all these, but do you realize you've just ordered you know, two and a half thousand dollars worth of tests here? Is your patient actually gonna be better off of that? Just to give them some reflection on being responsible uh, users of the healthcare system. Um, the, those same counters can be used to sort of measure various things. Um, it does come down to that. Well, how do you, how do you measure thinking? Well, that starts to get to be like Plato's cave and terrorism sort of philosophical. Um, that is dubious, but you can certainly measure actions. You can measure activity. What do people do? And one of the things we found is quite interesting is that what people say they would do and what they actually do, given some of these situations can be quite different. And you can measure reality. And it comes back to that, that example I gave earlier about uh, feedback to learners. It's sometimes quite nice to just rather than do the you're a very naughty boy, just to here's what you do, here's what your peers do, and just let them reflect and look at either on their own time or in a live discussion, you know, make, make their own conclusions, etc. On the team-based learning side of things uh, in our new OLAV 4, we are setting things up so that people can play the same case in parallel in different roles. And as they interact, that the counters for each of their sessions start to interact. Uh, and that starts to get kind of interesting. So you could do things like uh, what we call lifeboat scenarios. You're in a lifeboat, you have several hundred people, you only have uh, four bags of sailing in the, in the rescue kit. How are you going? You've got the three people who are in shock. How are you going to distribute this uh, limited resource so you get the most out of it? Um, that sort of get, looking at how people play with each other and do they compete or collaborate, etc. cetera. Um, and one of the things that we're interested in exploring is that on the team-based activity side of things, all of the metrics so far for team-based activities always look at global function of the team. There is no other tool out there which looks at individual team member activity. So it doesn't allow for things like, um, is somebody actually an active contributor or are they a coaster? You know, you know in any small group, there's always the person who's sort of floating around the background and do that, I agree, the cheerleader, I'll go get the coffee and stuff like that, um, where there's activity, but is it meaningful? There's, there's some really interesting stuff that can be explored there. And that's what we're looking at in OLAB 4. So if uh, groups have uh, interesting projects which look at that side of things, we'd be happy to talk to you. All right, so um, I th- that's all I needed to prattle on about in those three bits. So they're, they're, it's not, I'm not throwing those concepts out as you need to understand all of that in order to become a good author. They're just tasters of some of the ways in which we use it all out to give you a sense that, um, that it isn't just choose your own adventures. There's a ton of things you can do and some interesting tools built within it. All right, uh, happy to take any immediate questions if there's any bursting ones. Otherwise, um, suggest we go back to our uh, breakout rooms and uh, a bit more sort of uh, time with uh, with our with our small groups and just explore some of these issues. We're good on time. We have two minutes until the scheduled breakout okay. room too. All so right. if there so are if any questions, any, yeah, <laughs> I have to take some uh, questions about any of these things I was just talking about there. Oops, stop share.
So I think if there are no questions, then I will recreate the breakout rooms as they uh, as they were. Um, apologies if anyone was waiting or is waiting. If, if sometimes people pop up in the breakout room and I'm in the room, so I will see if you're oh. somehow get back. If you get kicked out of the meeting, for instance, you come back in. Um, I will see you there and reassign you. Um, I'm just. We break, I, Tim did raise yeah. a hand. Did you have a oh, question? Oh, sorry, Tim. Go ahead. It's not super pressing. I was just curious. Uh, I guess this is a question to anybody. Uh, tying in assessment grades, formative or summative, to the software. Something that I know we've shied away from, the research shies away from for physical in-person medical simulation. Uh, but I'm wondering if anyone has any insight on if open lab or a branching scenario software has been used for that. Uh, yes, it has. And uh, one of our sim groups in Calgary is also very much as, oh, you can't put grades into this, it inhibits discussion. Um, I think that's bullshit. I think that's cowardice. The, um, anybody who goes into these things thinking they're not being assessed is naive. Of course, you, you are always being assessed all the time. Whether it becomes a formal thing or not is different. Um, uh, but the... It, it's more about it's scores can be useful and it's not scores as into as to who won it's how did you do people like to get a sense of how they performed and then you then give them good constructive feedback so again it's not that you failed even for that poor lass who was distressed about um about having you know killed the kid she still wanted to get back in there and figure out how to do this. And it's way better to have something flub in simulation than it is in real life. So I'm, I, I, I'm not a big subscriber to, the, uh, to this, uh, uh, you know, you shouldn't, shouldn't score sims. I, that's, I don't buy that. But anyway, personal bias. All right, okay, let's jump to our, uh, jump to our groups. All right, so I'm setting breakout rooms. Uh, so last time was 25 minutes. I left a bit of room for the intros. This time I'm gonna make it, should I make it 20? Sounds Stick good. to our schedule, I'll make it 20. Uh, still with the two minute warning. So when you get the two minute warning, it means that, um, that, that you have two minutes to wrap it up. All right, okay, so shout out number two. Um, so again, ran, we can do the round robin approach again. I would suggest that we um, um, start in a slightly different order so it's not one, two, three, four, so the group one doesn't always get the limelight. Um, any, um, let's, let's go start with group three. Any, any interesting comments come out of the group three discussion? So we were um, kind of engulfed in going through all the different features. <laughs> um, and we got cut off a little bit when we were going through the, the critical pathway. So we'll definitely jump back to that um, briefly in breakout room three. Um, but it was just very interesting for them to see how the case that we showed in breakout room one was um, modeled in the visual editor. Um, so I felt like there was uh, interesting um, kind of like, oh, that's how you do it or that's how you create that, um, that node and you create the connections through. So I think um, we weren't able to get to too many questions in that sense, but I feel like uh, that was the way that they saw how a case was created and that was a little, was interesting to them. Cool. And, and we touched a little bit on it in our, in our session, just path analysis and stuff. So the, one of the core pieces in the middle of OLAB is this concept mapping tool where you basically you join pages or join the dots as to how you want your story. And that physical layout of how you place things on the page is entirely up to the author, that it, it, be, um, that, uh, it, it becomes quite a personal thing, you, how you lay things out. There are some recommended layouts that uh, help for more complex cases. Um, but that same idea of being able to move things around, et cetera, is quite useful for authors when you're constructing a case because you can use it as almost like a mind mapping tool. Sorry, somebody else was going to ask a question on the back of the point that uh, Krista made. All 
already. Group two, did you have a highlight or something that you wanted to touch on? Um, we had some questions come in. Um, so comparing uh, the branching scenario tool in H5P compared to, you know, Open Labyrinth, uh, we talked briefly about how Open Labyrinth is a little bit more versatile. Um, it's got a, a bit of a steeper learning curve because a lot of different things are customizable. Um, and then Natalie also asked another question about feedback. And so it's not something that I covered all that much in, uh, in my own scenarios, like providing feedback in the scenario itself to students, right? So for example, if I have a patient and I only allow them to choose two tests that they're allowed to order, um, what kind of ways are there to provide feedback in the scenario itself immediately um, based on the, on the student's choice? Could you um, elaborate on that a little bit, um, sure. David? So uh, there's some very simple ways. So within like a um, standard, like a, what's called a checkbox question. So you give them say five options and they click on various things. You can give them just an immediate pop-up which gives a little green check mark, a little red X along with uh, immediate feedback as to whether it was a good or a good not, a not good answer. Very simple, very easy to do, and it's done in other software as well. The only downside to that is that when they select or deselect those things, it's not actually tracked. It's just when the page is refreshed, the final answer. So for exam situations or something where you want to know what they click, that's slightly less good. Um, common situation we use is with, uh, by giving them choices as a set of pages to go through. Um, and uh, we use what's called a dandelion because the, the puffball of choices and how they're interlinked when there's lots of them looks just like a dandelion head. Uh, but as they click and move between the pages, so you choose this, you go there and you give them feedback right within the page. You chose to do a chest x-ray, um, uh, the patient tells you that they're pregnant and isn't it a good idea, doctor, not to do x-rays? So you decide that you can't do that. So little things like that, you can uh, give them sort of little wrinkles which um, mess with their heads or complicate their choices or, and it's not that you couldn't possibly do a chest x-ray, you just have to use shielding. So do they think about stuff like that? So you can give the mini consequence of each step and allow them to back out again, et cetera. And that's very trackable. Um, or um, you can uh, give them feedback through the scores or through um, this various little things like we have something called 4R, which is uh, rapid real-time response recording or something like that. So you basically you look for the group as to who chose what out of us on a Likert scale, and then you reflect for the group as to what the first, second, and third most popular choice are. So there's lots of different little ways that you can give them uh, real-time or post-talk feedback as to, as to how they did. Does that help? Cool. It helped me too, yeah. All right, good. Group one. I put a, a message in that we didn't actually, we were sort of uh, discombobulated by the whole great out rooms thing, or I was, but um, also, uh, you know, sort of with lots of demos and just showing the back end and the visual editor, uh, no particular point or question jumped out, but uh, open to the group if, if something's come up uh, from group one. Does anybody want to jump in? So I guess we can do uh, group four. Any particular points that anyone wants to highlight? My group is going to feel feel um, uh, a little bit sort of um, uh, cheated because I haven't shown the software at all. We've talked around some of the design things and how you would use this. Um, I've intentionally done that. Not that I'm trying to hide anything from you, but I find that actually playing with the tool yourself is a better way of learning rather than. Uh, quick little demos, etc. That you know, people like it, but the it's that stuff. Getting your head around how to use the concept mapping tool is not that hard. Uh, whereas, why you would use a certain approach or how you would integrate this into your teaching and curriculum. Anytime we've done longer course workshops and actually you know followed up with people as to that's the stuff they really struggle with. So I somewhat apologize to my group for that I haven't done more in the way of demos, but you, you can bully me into it, that's okay. 
I, th I think we're all doing a little bit different things in our breakout rooms, depending on our experiences and our, our kind of knowledge. And I think that's, that's fine. There's a, um, but just so you know, uh, links to all of the exemplar cases that are used in the workshop and that, you know, that will, will send you everything afterwards. So you'll be able to play with, play the cases from the student perspective. Uh, you know, all the stuff we're using is open access, um, accessible and, uh, and David has kindly will will ask you to um, to sign up for an account if you are interested and you'll be able to play with the 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 teacher end as well. Great, Michelle, you have a question. You put your hand up. Maybe you just want to go to the bathroom. <laughs> no, that's me. That's me. Um, thank you so much for this uh, workshop, and I love the software. It's so super super intuitive and simple. It looks like to like play with it and then I get lost, but it looks amazing. Um, just in terms of the pathways uh, that the students are taking and feedback that we might build into the software, is there an optimal pathway? Like uh, there may not be one right answer, but but uh, when you're building the scenarios, do you, do you tend to sort of build this would be the, the way an expert might approach this problem? That's a really good question. So we have looked at that. Um, so at a simpler level, uh, so you, you can set up the case so that there is what you consider as the expert in this area to be the optimal pathway and you can give the feedback along those lines. What I find more interesting, especially in cases where you're trying to promote the idea of discussion and that this is real life and there's more than one way to skin that rabbit, that you look at what did the group do? What sort of, what's the pattern of what the, the pathways were like? Um, there's some interesting stuff, um, which we looked at a number of years ago. It didn't work out quite as well as we liked, but where we actually used um, hidden Markov chain analysis, which is a really weird statistical thing, where you actually measure deviance from a path, and it's all about graph and network theory and stuff like that. And you, the idea was that you could actually measure in a complex node set what the optimum path really should be when, when you looked at how multiple experts tackled the same case. It was kind of an interesting thing to explore. Uh, you need a big fat grant to do that because it's quite difficult to do. So, so we showed theoretically as possible, but it's not not something I could say. Oh yeah, just you know, throw that Markov stuff in there. Anybody can do it. It was we had some. Uh, it was quite an ambitious project, which uh, didn't uh, didn't get to completion as much as we like. But theoretically, the possibilities there. Yeah. I just wanted to chime in. Um, we've. We have a bit of buffer at the end of of the um, of this workshop, so um, but we're just slightly behind in in time. So maybe we can um, uh, essentially start with our next didactic session, so that we can get into the third breakout room, and then maybe we can hold a few more questions until until the end. All right, good. Okay, so let me see my thing. Wait, I'm ready to go. All right, session three. Share screen. Mm -hmm. I'm running. Helps if I click on the right thing. All right, so session three. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, how yeah, the important things to think about in your learning designs, etc. A little bit about um, the practicalities of measuring and assessing what people actually do. Um, and then we touched on this a little bit already, but uh, I'll maybe talk a little bit more about uh, cases as a driver of a small group discussion. So first of all, um, the, with apologies to any instructional designers amongst our group, this, you know, that what's the difference between learning design and instructional design is uh, sometimes hotly debated. Um, but what I'm basically getting at is, what are, you, what are you trying to do with uh, the case? What are you trying to get out of it? And uh, yes, you do want to start with the end in mind that what is the purpose of the exercise? If you like the learning objectives, um, the, to, I can't remember if this is a, an example that came from the small group or the larger, uh, larger group, but um, so say within medicine, we find early on that um, uh, our teachers tend to get all enthusiastic about this and then they, they, they want to build the perfect case which is going to teach the students everything they need to know about diabetes. But if you think about sending a student to go and see a patient uh, in the ward or in clinic, 
you're not expecting them to learn everything. You're hoping they will get one or two key parts out of that particular case or the complication or something about their management. It's at most three or four learning points out of a case. Think what those are and keep coming back to those in your learning design. Uh, the graphic here shows just a very simple example of an earlier version of our concept mapping tool, but you can, even from the get-go, you can use this concept mapping tool to, it's your starting point, and you just join up the boxes, first main point, second, third, and finish, and there's the skeleton of your case, and then you can flesh things out from there, that the, uh, the visual editor, the concept mapping tool, is not just as a theoretical thing, it allows you to actually uh, formulate and experiment with how you want them to play out the case. But do keep returning to those uh, those key points because if you don't, it, it's so easy to get off into the weeds and spend way too much in the early phases without getting those points across. So um, a simple point, but one which is frequently forgotten. All right, cases as a discussion driver. Um, the and we've talked about this a, a, a little bit. The um, we have certainly found at multiple levels that having cases where there is not a perfect or clear answer does drive some very interesting discussions. Um, it is more accepted by more experienced and more senior learners, uh, and you have to be careful not to sort of over overwhelm your learners early on. And I must say that from some of our early medical students, they often reject this. They hate the idea that every other teaching modality they've had has been the perfect case. This is a new, the perfect doctrine. This is what you should do. And they get stuck on that thinking that there is always a perfect answer. And no matter how many times you reflect to them that, hey, that's not what happens in real life. There is no little man who leaps out of the bushes with the red flag and say, don't do that, doctor, that's not a good idea. Um, that you have to learn to deal with the consequences of what you do. Uh, we do find that when we take this approach with our early learners, often our workshop ratings are not very good because they don't like being pushed out of their comfort zone. We find as instructors, when you look at how they think and, and problem solve, that they do do better when you do this, uh, but it doesn't always help your teacher rating score, so I'll caution you on that. But certainly as, as you move into more experienced learners or practitioners in the field, or um, and again, it doesn't have to be clinical, that people who are used to dealing with problems in the field, they, they find this sort of stuff much more relatable. And uh, it, it uh, it, it can be very powerful to, to, to get some debate and discussion going. Um, on the uh, measurement and assessment, so uh, absolutely everything you do in OLAB is, uh, is tracked down to the millisecond, you know, when you click, where you go, whether you use the back button, etc., all the clicks and counters. Um, this, this horrible little graph is one of our cruder outputs that you can get, and it's, it's from one case where, as a resuscitation case, and uh, the blue line is a rising heart rate, and the pink line is a falling uh, uh, blood pressure and blood volume, etc. Um, those trends should not be going in that direction. The, the apologies, it's messy, but the, but you can build that into the report at the end, or you can give them. Uh, running counters just like with any other games sort of this is how many gold coins you have this is how many lives you have left this is uh, uh, you are now upgraded from a sword to a shield um, you can do all that sort of fun stuff if you want um, we, we built a complete board game in an early version of all um, it was uh, like the, uh, uh, the, the board game uh, life or careers and it was to, to help medical students and did think about some of the factors, whether they, what sort of career do they want to have in medicine, whether they want to be a pathologist or more in laboratory, or do they want to be a plastic surgeon, or do they want to be, etc. So it was quite fun. It took hundreds of hours to develop. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody who wants to retain their sanity, but just as an example of what you can do. Um, the outputs, all those tracking that numbers, you can feed it back in a session report or you can export it out to Excel or as a comma separated file to your favorite analytical tool for people who really want to get into this stuff. I'll 
not to spend too long on that and see if we get questions on that afterwards. Um, so those are the main things I wanted to touch on there. The, um, we have used uh, OLAB in high stakes um, full up exam situations. Um, there are some constraints around doing that because you are still generally working as um, with the software as a browser, um, which it makes it somewhat difficult to control what else they do in the computer. Um, we have found the, the fact that because everything they do is tracked, that that's actually very useful in terms of um, one hates to think about cheating, but it is a known fact of life that, depending on how pessimistic your assessments are, between 50 and 90% of students cheat significantly at some point in their, in their career. It's not that I'm looking to catch the cheaters so much as just pro provide data to deter them from, from doing so. So there's, there are some useful things within all that to do that. All right, so uh, how am I doing for time, Jason? Can't hear you. Sorry, I pressed Alt Tab instead of Alt A. Um, we're doing okay. We're um, again, we have a bit of buffer at the end, um, but we're like five minutes behind. But it's not that big of a deal because okay. we do have that time, extra time at the end of the. Okay. Uh, so happy to take uh, any questions about the little bits I've talked about there. Um, the, so the, we'll have one more breakout session, and at the very end, I'll just touch on some of the advanced, uh, some of the advanced functions in OLAB. And in the final few minutes, there, there's a there's a funding opportunity that I just want to throw quickly out to some of you. It's got a very short timeline, and some of you may have heard of, heard of it already, but we'll touch on that too. Uh, any questions at this point about uh, what we just covered in session three here, Michelle? Yes, thanks. Um, well, Jason, Jason touched on it in our last breakout room, but when you kind of go into your sessions and you want to see how the group did as a whole and as far as like how it's, um, I guess it's kind of plotted on a graph to see where where different people, the, the choices that different people made. Um, is that, is, is it like, is it fairly easy to see visually or is there, you know, like, can you see kind of a concentration of dots or yeah, it's, um, we haven't, so you can do that. We've not had a lot of requests for it. And as with most functions in OLAB, when you want that sort of customized functionality, all OLAB development is predicated on project funding. And so if a group wants that sort of thing, if they have some money, we'll build it into the software. Um, okay. The Mostly we have taken the data and put it into other software for doing that. Um, okay. There are some simple things you can do within within OLAB for looking at group activities, and it gets a bit confusing in terminology because uh, we use something called scenarios for that. So within OLAB speak, a scenario from that perspective is a group of learners and a group of cases, and you're using that grouping for analytics. It does get confusing because more recently, now we talk about, instead of talking about patients or cases, we talk about scenarios as being a case the change in terminology in multiple areas has been sufficiently confusing that we actually have like a flipping glossary for the different versions as to what the terms mean. I apologize for that. But um, if you're interested in exploring that further, ping me a message and I'll tell you more about how to use uh, uh, scenarios as a case grouping tool. Great, okay, I think I'll, I'll do some more exploring first to see yeah, yeah. what it looks like, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to throw an idea out there because uh, it turns, since we are able to allow participants to choose a room and since we're running a tiny bit behind, I wonder if we can go back to our original plan and David, instead of doing the, as an after session, the, the, this, the, the group, if you wanted to do that now, it's up to you. Sure, we could do that now. Yeah, I'm happy. We don't have to break out into our pre predefined groups. We can. No, we don't. So I'm I because now it's and that didn't work. The predefined rooms was it? It didn't. It didn't. It didn't work. It didn't put people back in the same rooms. So I'm opening the rooms now. It's going to give you options, so you can come back into the room with. Uh, um, uh, I will be in room one. Jason, room two. Krista, room three. Still. 
Um, if you're not so interested in funding and collaboration opportunities, uh, join one of our rooms if you were with David. If you are interested in funding collaboration issues and would like to go and speak with David about that, that's room four and David will be in room four talking about that. Uh, the other three rooms, we are build, we're doing a mini group case build. So that's, uh, that's the plan for the other three rooms. Great, good. Thanks for explaining that, Kathy. And I shan't feel mortified if I am speaking to myself at the end. It's not, not a need for, for everybody. So how many minutes have we got left here? 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Okay, yeah. let me quickly get into uh, the last block here. And I shall share my screen and we'll be off and running. Amazing, it worked. So uh, advanced functions, last little quick blast through. So um, the, the book ending and stuff, I already talked about a little bit. That's the idea of uh, connecting things like uh, high fidelity sims, etc. Uh, there's two things that I do want to touch upon because they've been real standouts in terms of practical functionality. One is Turk Talk, which is a way of, it's a cheat way of building a natural language processing. Uh, there was uh, one of our group was asking earlier, how do you deal with the, you want to give them a choice, but you don't want to give them predefined choices. And this is one way to do it. And then I'll finish off a uh, quick touch on some of the things happening in all out four. So Turk Talk. Uh, this arises from uh, something from the, I think it was uh, 18th century, so mid 1700s, where uh, an Ottoman uh, emperor uh, devised a, uh, a mecha like an automaton that could play chess. Uh, yeah, way back in the mid 1700s. And uh, it, was, it was a scam. It was basically a human hidden in the box directing the actions of this automaton. But it, was a, it was a very clever ruse uh, and the story itself is fascinating to look up. Anyway, the, com the, the, the premise here is that you have a computer pretending, sorry, a human pretending to be a computer uh, and that story is propagated. So uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk um, service is that same idea is delegating tasks out to humans which computers are not very good at and natural language processing is one of these you can devise software which will accept um, natural language questions etc uh, uh, th there are some dram there's a dramatic example of the maryland project where they developed this brilliant virtual patient that you could pretty much throw any question at it and it would give you a reasonable answer most of the time. Um, it, 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 was a, it was a single module on nephrology, I think, but it was a quite interesting case and you, could, you couldn't talk to it, but you could type questions to it and it would give you real answers. The trouble was that it cost, it cost them $11 million and took six years to develop. And when they demonstrated, they like, wow, brilliant, that's really good. Well, it wouldn't, wouldn't be so bad to uh, create the next one, would it? You know, the next case. And they said, well, all the programming was so domain specific, it would cost about the same to do it again. It could get really complicated to do good la uh, language processing. Now, things have gotten better and you do have things like chatbot software, which will now do that, which will handle simple phrases um, much better. And we are exploring those. But even with chatbots, the challenge there is it typically takes two, three, four months to, to put the rules in place for a single chatbot, for a single case. And that exceeds for most schools the amount of time and resources they have available. So that works great for Talos and Bell and all these kind of things where they have hundreds of customers and they want to just uh, steer them around a limited set. But the average, uh, average author who's got maybe four or five hours to design a case is not practical. So what we did instead was a little chat based interface, just like these chat things with help desks. And it allows, um, so on the left side of the screen, here's Hattie and you're entering tech drop zone. So the little chat box in the middle there, you're just texting backwards and forwards with a teacher, but the teacher is running three or four concurrent conversations. They can run up to eight. And so the uh, box in the bottom right here is a quick look at a screenshot of um, looking at um, 
it's actually my super view where I'm looking at 16 learners concurrently and just keeping an eye on how the teachers are doing. It sounds clunky, especially just texting back and forwards. It is amazing how well it's worked. The learners love it. It's nice and simple. It, uh, the authors like it because it's easy to design the cases and it allows them to uh, practice things like difficult conversations, telling somebody that they've got cancer or that uh, they, you know, they or asking them about uh, drug use or sexual history, things like that, where learners get into difficulties of phrasing things, etc., allows them to practice that with their teachers through these text-based interviews. And then all of the, uh, of the discussions are recorded and you can actually use things like uh, uh, text processing and sentiment analysis to evaluate the cases. Cool stuff and it's worked really, really well, much better than we thought it would do. Uh, second little tool that's built into OLAB, it's actually a, um, so we did uh, some work a number of years ago about um, on videos and procedural videos. Um, creating your own videos can be quite expensive. Um, one of the things we found with the likes of YouTube is that for any given procedure or thing you want to teach, there's so many videos out there that there's almost certainly going to be somebody has done some, some, something along these lines but there's never a perfect video. You usually want like 20 seconds from this one and 37 seconds from that one. So this Curio's mashup tool is a way of grabbing segments from existing YouTubes, whether they're your own YouTube or somebody else's and just mashing them together. It is a much faster way of curating and assembling video tools. And the nice, because it doesn't touch the original video, you don't have to we encourage asking permission, which is not required. Sometimes you can't contact the author, but you can still you know, grab any of these little snippets, etc. because you're not actually affecting the original content. You're just doing what are called time cuts. Uh, the, it nicely bypasses copyright arguments, etc. But it's the, and the, uh, on the production side of things, it is really quite efficient. So anybody's interested in doing video stuff, there's a great way to do it. The book ending I talked about a couple of occasions. So the idea that you can use uh, virtual scenarios and virtual patient cases to uh, embed it around or you know, pre, you know, do pre and post with high fidelity sims or other, uh, other interfaces. Um, we've had some quite a lot of success with that. Um, I'll spend the last few minutes on, so OLAB 3, it's the, it's, clunky and elderly and it's getting near end of life we're working on all of four which is so anything developed in all app three will be playable in all app four uh it's a simpler cleaner interface we've stripped out a lot of the added sort of bits that turned out not to be particularly useful in all lab things like forums and stuff like that um as kathy was telling us earlier setting up an all lab, all lab server is a bit of a pain in the butt there won't be a server to maintain this will all be what are called callable microservices uh, which will make it much easier to tie into other tools like uh, Moodle and stuff like that and then the last thing about it is that you can fairly easily share uh, cases and bits of cases on the same uh, OLAB server it's much more it's more difficult to, sh uh, to share fragments of cases across multiple servers with OLAB 4 uh, we've got what's called a shared object model, which that, that Lego block thing we were talking about becomes much more extensible. So people, we do find in case development that people are, are frequently recreating things over and over again. It's the same little liquid question of the same little list, the same little band. Well, why don't we make that shareable? It's just going to speed up everybody's uh, case production. So that's where we're going with that and uh, always looking for project funding to help move that forwards. All right, so uh, the quick look at what OLAB 4 looks like. So it's the same basic um, concept mapping tool where you join up the boxes, uh, but more is done within the tool. So you can do more editing of any particular node with little pop-up boxes. Uh, the object picker, this is the, the scoped objects where you can grab things which are um, uh, more easily shared across uh, different cases, etc. And uh, the, uh, in our last group four discussion, we talked a little bit about this SIM calendar funding opportunity. 
there is money. The deadline is June 4th. It's not a big long application. It's just basically a fill in the form, but there is money for, for people to uh, author cases. Sim Canada is looking for 120 cases through the summer. Topic areas being nursing, paramedicine, and med lab techs. So for some of you, that won't be so uh, helpful. Um, but there is money for authoring cases. So if you're interested in that, go check the Sim Canada or sim1.ca website and the grant call is in there. It's not often you get money for developing cases as opposed to doing research. And uh, this is um, not to be missed. Alrighty, so after the workshop, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that we'll uh, leave as available. And I think at this point, I'll throw it open for final comments and questions in the little bit of time we have for remaining. We had a, a couple of interesting questions in uh, room two, actually. Um, so um, a few of us were concerned about how to really make sure um, students know where they are in the labyrinth, right? And so uh, Beth and Lorraine um, were asking questions about how can we simplify um, like things like the button so that students know that they are going back and they don't have to necessarily memorize the titles of certain nodes in the branching scenario. So the first thing was, can we can we rename buttons yes in the branching scenario based on which node you are in yes okay so generally the name of the button is the title of the node you're going to but you but you can change that and there's several different ways of doing that okay but that does help the other way which you can do to help with where you are uh, we sometimes use counters like so the counter would be like your page count you are on page 25 out of 30 or you have progressed through 75% of the case. Like, so you can, you can use that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, the other way of helping is you can use sections within a case, which is sort of like paragraph markers. So you can set it up so that if it's not important that they do the whole case in order, that they can jump from section one to section three. And that's, that's relatively easy to do. So easy okay. way to do and, and another thing uh, Lorraine had brought up was, um, so when we click the review button, uh, that's usually there in the top uh, bottom left corner. Students get to see exactly which nodes that they've seen. Is there a way to highlight any of those? Like maybe highlight a, a certain node if the students are in that node in particular? Like, are we able to manipulate anything in that list? And the review pathway list itself, no, unless you could, well, I wouldn't even encourage uh, customizing the design because all that three is nearly end of life anyway. Okay. Um, but within a design where you wanted to allow that kind of interface, you could actually do that. You would just set up the interface in a slightly different way. Super. Um, I guess one last thing. When uh, Claire asked a question in the, in the thing, um, in the chat, when is OLAB 4 going to be released? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could give you a solid answer on that. It was supposed to be released last year. The, uh, we had a bunch of funding and the, uh, an external developer team, and they got 80% of the way through, and then the funding came to a stop. And we went, what about the other 20%? And they said, well, the money's done. We're going, you're supposed to develop a complete project for that. Anyway scrap over that um so there is an alpha version available now if somebody wants to, desperately wants to try it we are happy to make that available i wouldn't recommend it for production use because it's not that it breaks but it's still it's clunky you have to be pretty tolerant of, of software to the the it, it, it needs the rough edges worked off um we do know that anything which is developed in OLAB 3 is fully you know, importable to OLAB 4. That's not an issue. So it's not like the, um, your stuff is going to be orphaned as, as we make the transition. Doing that switch over is nice and easy. Um, we have a few projects on the go just now which look promising for finishing off the development, uh, but none confirmed at this point. Soon is my best answer. I see people are um, slowly trickling out. So, um, and I'll, I'll be on for a few minutes. Um, you know, if there's questions for, uh, you know, people are want to struggle and, and uh, ask more specific questions, but just um, to let you know, uh, I posted, it's it's moved up the chat, so I will repost it. It's a sign-up sheet for uh, demo accounts. 
Um, so uh, you just have to open that document and uh, and and sign your name. I'm reposting it right now. I see a lot of people have already signed up. Um, thank you to everyone for coming, uh, for participating. Um, we're we're probably you know. Krista and I would likely do a follow-up uh, hands-on workshop in the fall for, you know, people who are interested in more of a how-to uh, detailed, um, and we have your the, the mail out list. So if we do end up organizing something like that in a computer lab where you can sit and build cases and, you know, dive into more of the tech aspect, um, you know, that's an à suivre coming. So um, we'll let you know. And I'd certainly like to thank... Uh... Kathy and Krista and Jason for co-hosting and helping with the small groups and stuff. And uh, I also appreciate the fact that they as a group have come up with some great uh, ideas and suggestions about things that we should be building into all that for and just how to make the whole uh, process better. This is how the software has gotten better over the years. It is now the longest lasting uh, uh, virtual patient software out there. It's uh, 20 years old next month. Uh, showing his age a little bit, but it's this kind of collaborative sharing ideas and workshops like this which help this stuff. So thank you all. This has been great. And uh, in addition, I have some release next next year for this. So if ever you guys are starting to work in OLAB and you have any questions, um, I'd love to be able to help. And if it's over my head, well, we have a direct link to David. <laughs> um, so feel free to kind of reach out to us as well. Um, I'm not saying that I know everything about OLAB, but if it's something that we can problem shoot together and work through, um, I'd be happy to do so. Same, same here. I'll be working with OLAB and Saltese and, uh, and thank you to David for coming and waking up at uh, very, very early in the morning uh, to be online from Calgary with us today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank God I'm not that was great. great. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for attending. Thank you so much. It was super interesting. Thank you. You're very welcome. And really great questions, you guys. This was this this is one of the, the most interesting sessions that we've had. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, team. Way to go. You're well superb, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I see Jan is still here. Do you have a question, Jan? No, you just. Uh... <laughs> I was just writing a uh, thank you. <laughs> well, <you're very> well. <laughs> so, so I'll just say it. Thank you very much for that great session. I've learned a lot, and uh, I'm not sure I'll be using it this summer because I kind of need a break. But uh, I'll uh, definitely try to use it. Uh, <laughs> totally get it in a few yeah. months. Yeah. Yeah. If you need help, we'll be around, and I'll be. I know the that's what's great as well. So yeah, <laughs> perfect, perfect. Thank I'm you. sure I'll see you around the Salties conference. Yeah, yeah, I'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> I suggest we have uh, within the next week or so while it's fresh in our heads that the uh, four of us have a little debrief, etc. I think it, my sense was that it went well, but always mm -hmm. with these things, good ideas and good suggestions come out of it. And, uh, yeah. It's something we've learned. Yeah. You kind of think you've heard everything. No, there's always good suggestions and it's really good. Yeah. I'm wondering if uh, generally workshops, we are asked for feedback, right? Like my experience with previous workshops at Saltees. Um, so we so probably. I, I wrote to Sue, and she said there's a general um, there's a general uh, survey that's sent out for the whole conference. Okay. I don't know how specific the questions are. If if they ask, you know, specifically about yeah. individual mm. workshops, I'm not yeah. sure. So. Um, I will ask her to give us any feedback that comes out of that. If we want to, uh, you know, send a post workshop survey of our own, I think we can. It's uh, I have all the email addresses. It's uh, I don't know if it's necessary, um, but yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to see what sort of general feedback we get from Salties. It's, it was more um, things that we got about out of it yeah. as in. I never thought about such and such, or that was a cool idea, or we should make a note of this for future development, or this is a mm -hmm. psychic way that Zoom does such and such, we need to find a way, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got, people are looking for. I got mm -hmm. three messages from people in my groups that said they're converted. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> nice. Excellent, good. So, awesome. That's a good thing. Yeah, there seem to be really just a lot of, you know, really good interest and, and enthusiasm and ideas and yeah, really interesting questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Not all of which I can always answer. So 
I would be interested in a advanced users because I still have questions too about you know some of the stuff that and it's hard to find it anywhere in the user yeah. manuals and some of the stuff maybe it's just deprecated you know it's just like oh that's a yeah, button that's, that's there from just, before yeah. and it's just we're getting rid of it because it's it's, yeah. it's it's remnants of something but as a as a user it's like what, what am I missing here because there's all yeah. this stuff that's like what is that I don't know what that is and it's, that's like 50% of stuff you know what you want to do you don't know where to look it up in all that because so that question about how you get group scores etc yeah mm -hmm. very weird terminology thing around well, what is a tsunami or such so yeah the documentation is complete um but it is say it's some of it is elderly and some of it is very like it's 473 pages in the years ago it's, it's just hard <laughs> At least all that for is a bit, bit, bit easier that way. Yeah. yeah. Definitely the video tutorials were the most useful in getting me started, but and that's mm -hmm. great, but digging into the the like the more complex functions i think you know it's it would be good to have and things like you know um this interactive uh, map where you you know you can um circle stuff and write onto the i don't know if you saw that david i posted it in the uh but anyway, we can talk about it at a different, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also the the teacher feedback. That's the other yeah. like area that I'm like still, you know, like yeah. per question feedback. Like I'd like to be able to look at a question yeah. and see. And I'm sure there's maybe there's a way to do it. That we can do that. It's it's not that well documented, and some areas are not as well developed. Mostly because we get lots of requests from groups about we want this to be done better, but so group so few groups actually use it that um uh it's it, it's mm. it, it's difficult to find sort of the right sort of balance there but yeah happy to sort of explore more, more stuff along those lines yeah yeah uh, and we don't have to do it now like next uh, yeah. week I'll, uh, debrief over that yeah. sounds Super. good <laughs> sounds great right. thank you so much <clears throat> thank you very much it was very yeah, it was informational fun. uh for all of us i think <laughs> yeah, we all yeah, learned lots thank you have a great day all right Bye. take care Bye. everybody